Welcome back to another episode of The Piano Pod. I am Eric Hunter. I am Clara Zhang. I'm Yukimi Song. Our guest today needs no introduction. We are very excited to have Frederick Chu on our show, who is an international concert pianist with performances on five continents in venues such as Lincoln Center in New York, the Kennedy Center in Washington, the Chatelet in Paris, and the Mozartium in Buenos Aires. He has recorded over 30 albums. Uh, he is the founder of Deeper Performance Studies and recently a distinguished faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University and the Hart School. His non-traditional and innovative approach to art, including interdisciplinary collaborations and integration of new technologies distinguishes Mr. Chu as a 21st century pianist. So please join me in welcoping Mr. Frederick Chu. Yay, Thank welcome. 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 Thank you so Thank much, you so for, much joining. for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Frederick, I wanted to start off with a little anecdote. Um, I'm sure you don't remember, but uh, <laughs> I actually played for you in a master class many, many years ago. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I didn't mention it before now. But um, yeah, I was thinking about that. And uh, you made a big impression on me in just this, this one class. And I wanted to share that with our listeners. Uh, I'll probably paraphrase you very badly. But okay. <laughs> I remember we were working on some Bach and you were having me work on a passage. And you told me, don't think about whether it's good or it's bad on each repetition that you do, but think about what is my ideal that I want it to sound like and how much closer or further away from it am I getting? Um, and that really stuck with me, you know, that, that became an integral part of my practice wow. after that. You know, just from that that one masterclass. So I wanted I, I'm, to. I'm so happy. First of all, you saved it for the show. This big reveal, <laughs> <laughs> which is good. You got a reaction shot. Yeah. Um, and 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 second, I, I'm very honored that you have a memory of that that's that stayed with you. That's helped you. That's you know my goal uh, in playing and teaching is to leave a memory. And that obviously worked. So I'm, I'm really happy to, to hear that. And what you're saying is great. And that's a point that I always, uh, that always comes up. A lot of people, when they play, they, you know, nobody likes to make mistakes. But of course, a mistake is a great doorway into understanding something about your playing. I mean, nothing happens by mistake. Right. <laughs> a mistake <laughs> happens because it's supposed to happen that way for whatever reasons, all the things that you brought to it caused that to happen. And if you take the opportunity to look at it instead of judging and saying, ooh, that was good, ooh, that was bad, and somehow being attracted or detracted from it because of some value judgment, then you're not going to learn as much as you can from that moment. And it's really about learning. And, and anything that we play, no matter how good or how bad, if there's some learning that we can extract from it, uh, then we've improved ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. then we've added to our knowledge base and we're higher for that. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, agree. At the time, I think I had a very harsh inner critic, which I feel like a lot of musicians struggle with in their practice at one point or another. And uh, you got me to kind of view it from a larger perspective, you know, as a natural part of the process, mistakes mistakes are, mm -hmm. and that should really be in quotes, right? Because a mistake yeah. is not a mistake. Like you said, it, it shows you where you are. It's information, right? Yeah. And, um, and it's just another step on your journey towards becoming the kind of musician you want to be. Also something, you know, for pianists, we have to do a lot of our work alone. And even a lot of our end goal is done alone. We perform solo stuff alone. And we're very much in our own heads. And you know, to, to be very self-critical is a great thing, but it's also a very dangerous thing in a, in a vacuum, in an isolation uh, from others. And that's also something that I uh, found for myself that when I started teaching, when I started working with others, uh, there's so much that I learned from trying to communicate and communicating badly and then figuring out good ways to communicate. There's, there's so much to learn from just being forced to interact 
with other people and communicating things. And that takes you a little bit out of your bubble and gives you that perspective. So that's, that's uh, also very important. Yes. Well, thank you. I just, that's become a permanent part of the pianist that I am today. So. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you came up, you know, um, your early studies and then, you know, how that transitioned into your career? Yeah, I, I think my, I think my early, like first 10, 15 years is probably pretty typical looking. Um, you know, I, I would, my parents are both uh, immigrants from China, uh, very strong work ethic at home, uh, not very social in the sense of, you know, the, having sports and all these kinds of things to do. So, you know, like just doing a lot of good homework and a lot of good piano practicing. Typical, <laughs> good Chinese piano parents. Piano practicing, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I, I, I feel like music was something that I gravitate gravitated towards more because I was able to accomplish things, but not because I, you know, like saw a piano and said, Ooh, I want to play that thing. It was yeah, I can really something that. that I could do well at. Mm -hmm. It was suited uh, and I just moved ahead. And I, I think a lot of people recognize that, especially uh, uh, Asian, Asian American background, they, this idea that if you do this step well, then you go on to the next step, of course. You do yeah. this step well, and then you find yourself suddenly on this treadmill, and you're at at a far reach of that treadmill, and then you wonder, oh, how did I get here? <laughs> and for me, that moment of turning around and looking to see where I had been and deciding what to do going forward didn't happen until I was in my mid twenties, and by that time I had already gone to the Jacobs School in Bloomington. I had already gone to the Juilliard. I had already won competitions. I already had a manager, you know, so it wasn't like that. It was not a conscious choice until I was in my mid twenties. And there was a moment where all of a sudden everything came to light. And this was when I was um, struggling a little bit, uh, first arrived in Paris after finishing my studies. And, you know, Paris of course is incredibly inspiring place and, mm -hmm. and particularly for classical music, I think. Uh, and I was there for a year, at least that was the plan. And that year started off all of a sudden in catastrophe and I found myself almost homeless for seven months and certainly piano. Oh my goodness. Kitchenless, bathroomless for, for seven months. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, there. I knew that I was going to end up okay, but so it was just a matter of getting through these months. But it, you know, it was pretty traumatic and certainly very, very different than what I expected and different than what I wanted. And that was a very difficult time, but it was during this time that I was going all around Paris, looking for practice spaces and arranging with various contacts. You know, can I practice at your place tomorrow? Can I practice your place next week? And one of the places was a little a teaching studio in a, a, a private building uh, near the uh, Gallery Lafayette, uh, Chaussée d'Antin. And that happened, I came to the building, there was a plaque on the door that said Chopin lived here from <laughs> 1833 to 1836. So he was 23, 26 years old when he lived there. Mm -hmm. I was 24 at the time. Somehow everything that I had studied up until that moment in history class, all the things I had read, all these facts that we load our mind with as pianists, all of a sudden came to life. It was like, oh, wow, Chopin's a real person. Yes. Chopin was my age. I happened to be on this street in Paris that was probably still with the same cobblestones paving the street. And certainly this was the building. I'm going up the stairs, perhaps Chopin put his hand on this rail and uh, just like I am and even though the life was completely different, all of a sudden I was able to connect and empathize with Chopin as a person. And everything came to light and all of a sudden, everything that I was doing was put into a, a very different perspective. And I realized, wow, I've had this training. It's brought me to a point where I can obviously have some expectation of being able to achieve something, 
And that was when I doubled down and really decided, okay, I'm going to be a pianist. I'm going to do what I can with what I have. And all of a sudden I started practicing more. I started developing other ways to practice. I started seeing every moment in my life as an opportunity to practice. Yes. And to enlarge the idea of what practicing means to not just the time I spent sitting at the piano moving my fingers, but also non piano playing time and non music time, all of that was just feeding this, this system that allowed me to play the piano. Yeah, so can you talk a, a little bit more about that? Because um, I know for you, non-musical activities are a big part of the way you practice, right? And, and contribute to your music making. And um, I'm particularly interested in how you got this idea and how you drew the connections to see how it was affecting your musical output. Well, it was during these seven months where I literally was not practicing piano. I mean, uh, not in the sense that I was uh, uh, expected, uh, you know, uh, uh, that I had come to expect and need, kind of emotionally need those hours of practicing at the piano. I, I wasn't getting that. And so out of desperation, I tried all sorts of things like making a to-do list of passages that I really desperately needed to practice in the limited time that I had. Uh, and then the to-do list got me to open my scores to find things. And then I was basically doing a kind of improvised score study through that uh, exercise. Uh, and then just the extreme emotional experiences that I was having during these seven months. My life was pretty normal, you know, like, you know, happy and sad and, and nervous and whatever. But up until that moment, it wasn't life or death. And it wasn't, uh, you know, extreme stage fright when I did go on stage during these seven months to play or to record something. It was just harrowing mm -hmm. because even before getting on stage to see how I was reacting, I had convinced myself that I could not be playing at my best because obviously I had not been practicing what one needs to practice in order to play at one's best. So it was just a self-defined thing. And then of course, the self-fulfilling prophecy, I didn't play well uh, a lot. And then the system kind of reverts to the mean and all, the, all those years of training made me play okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it helped me to, <clears throat> I don't forget C major scales right. just because I'm nervous and uh, because I haven't practiced C major scales. So the basic tools were still there. And, and all of a sudden I realized that I could still kind of play. It wasn't terrible playing. And in fact, my memory was a lot better and I started to calm down, but it did take, you know, it's like going through withdrawal. It did take a number of weeks and months to get to the other side where I could look at myself and say, hey, the results aren't horrific. Uh, I'm still alive. And in fact, I'm gaining insight into areas that I didn't have before. And what is that coming from? And that's my natural kind of scientist side uh, just analyzing things and putting one thing after another, you know, just structurally trying to recreate what's what was happening. And my understanding was, okay, it was actually my my work with the score, my work without the score. And then I started defining those things. I started reading stuff that, you know, like the, the inner game of tennis and, and yeah, uh, great book. Zen, the art of motorcycle maintenance, you know, all these, also a great book. all these great books and, and kind of philosophical <laughs> uh, disruptors. And that disrupted me. I was disrupted already. So it was, it was great to, to have that. And that helped me codify some things. And I was wondering many years afterwards when I had, kind of settled these things for myself I was saying like why you know somebody could have taught this yes somebody could have at least given me some insight into this and not just kind of depend on the random encounter with a person who happened to talk about these things uh, or experience these things so I, I set out to create a curriculum which turned into deeper performance studies and you know taking people through some of these seminal experiences that I had that really give perspective that we don't get necessarily in, in school. 
Yes, we definitely want to ask you about deeper performance studies. Oh, I have, I have so much to say about that. What a wonderful story. Uh, thank you for sharing it. Um, I, I think I'm going to latch on to the last little bit where you said you wish somebody could have taught you. You know, one thing I'm finding as we interview more people for the show is a lot of people have this point where you've learned what you've learned, you put in the work, you went to school, did what you're supposed to do, right? And then at some point, you're just flying blind for whatever reason. Nobody can help you anymore. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. You're faced with something that you never dealt with before. And, um, and for anybody listening, I just want you to know that that's natural and normal and inevitable for many of us, but how you come out of that defines the kind of artist you're going to be. Um, yeah. You know. yeah, and I would say uh, to encourage all pianists, I truly feel uh, that it's there already. If you can, if you have the experience of getting on stage and playing a Beethoven sonata from memory for uh, an audience, I mean, it takes a lot of work, a lot of different kind of work over many, many years to be able to do that. Yes. And embedded in that work is all the stuff that you need. It's just inside of you, you may or may not be aware of it and you may or may not be confident or even knowledgeable about how to apply that to anything else except playing that Beethoven sonata. Right. But it's there. You know, it, I, you know if I think about, um, you know, somebody who goes to a country and is immersed in that country and learns the language, they can leave the country and still speak that language. You know, it's, they don't have to deal with things there geographically in order to use a, some of the skills that they learn. And playing the piano is like learning a language. It's a, it's a physical language. We have this understanding and control and sensitivity to our body and strength and balance and timing. It's uh, this mental world where we're, especially for pianists, multitasking constantly. We're strategizing, we're decomposing and recomposing things. We're understanding theory and architecture. And it's this emotional life where we deal with students, we deal with teachers, we deal with chamber music colleagues, we deal with a person you're playing for, you deal with a hundred people that you're playing for as a group, you're dealing with an anonymous, unknown listener behind the microphone who may be listening 10 years down, 100 years down the road. We're thinking we have all these opportunities to think about these interpersonal, really diverse interpersonal relationships. And how many people really get an opportunity to practice these things, yeah. you know, to, yeah. to have the opportunity to get mm -hmm. on stage and have full attention of people, even for five minutes, to memorize something and to be a master and solo, you know, responsible for something, to have the day-to-day -day experience of discipline and, and delayed gratification to arrive at being able to do something incredible. Yeah. It is a real most, opportunity. Most people in the world don't even get the chance to, to experience these things. And we have all of that and that's our life. Yeah. And so I really think that that is one of the things for pianists to encourage, that encouraged me. And I think that's one of the great things. If you've already gone through all those years and you're frustrated at the end, you have to turn back and turn in and take those things and somehow appreciate them and redirect them Right. It may not be in piano playing. It might be something completely non-pianist related, but your sense of discipline and your ability to present is going to aid you because you have it. Your ability to coordinate your fingers, to type, you know, like pianists generally are pretty fast typists. You know, that's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of digital control. You know, a lot of people don't know how to type. They're typing with... That's my know, wife. Like, you know... <laughs> no offense, Masha. But. No, that, you know, that, that, that's, it's, it's kind of silly, but that is something that we have an advantage mm -hmm. over other people in that area. Yeah. I think so the most it's valuable nothing thing... nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's something really to appreciate and to draw out because that will make you a better pianist. It will also make you better whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Whatever else you want to do. I mean, I think one of the most important things anybody can learn in life is how to learn. And, you know, serious study of musical instrument teaches you that. Mm -hmm. 
because it teaches it, it teaches you humility <laughs> <laughs> among other things <laughs> among yes, other things you're making you know like what what piano performance does not have a mistake in it of course <laughs> you know and if you play something uh, you know uh, god forbid you play something perfectly once Right. Does that mean that you expect it's going to be just staying there and plateauing forever? Yeah, you know, of course not. But a lot of people don't experience that mm -hmm. yes. day to day. Yeah, right. We experience that day to day and mm -hmm. we've found ways to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge emotional strength yes. that pianists have, that musicians have. Pianists mm -hmm. in particular have, have that. That's why we, we have resilience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Great, Amen right? To that. Wow, these are really, really useful uh, information. And thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. And uh, I didn't know all this background, you know, when you first moved to Paris, but uh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I feel like I almost can draw a little comparison with myself. You know, I, I moved here when I was 17 in Kansas. And then when I moved to New York when I was 23, 24, I had already finished everything. And life was great you know I, I decided to be a pianist when I was three but at that point I felt like everything was going smoothly you know I think that's also the problem when you don't have that big you know and then you don't and all of a sudden you arrive in New York you're like wow it's like you basically feel homeless you know like no you're here everybody's here you don't really know exactly how to get going but here you are you know you just have to make something out of it so i am so inspired now because of that and i have this <laughs> a little bit of chinese background and i know your father is also from the city i was born in uh, what is and when you went to paris as well i know you still do a lot of collaboration uh for example you uh work with uh, composer Gao Ping. And also, I saw this video, uh, it was lovely, uh, of a French movie, but they were singing in Chinese. Um, just because all of the musicians nowadays are all overseas, everywhere, you know, I want to hear your experience of drawing different culture and then you were born and raised here in America, right? How, could you yes. tell us a little bit? Uh, yeah, that, and I think that's definitely yeah. a strength of mine, having uh, a Chinese upbringing uh, American culture, and then somehow I went to the middle point between the U.S. and China and landed in Paris <laughs> and, <laughs> and kind of immersed myself. And I was drawn to Paris. I don't know why French was such a draw to me, but somehow a fascination with it. Uh, I never studied it in school, but I decided when the opportunity presented itself, oh, I'm going to spend some time in France. I ended up uh, living 12 years there and having a whole life, mm. getting married, having kids, mm. uh, uh, becoming a citizen. And I think those three cultures really have forced me to look at things from different perspectives. Mm. And, uh, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, I think that having three different points of view was very balancing and, and really kind of pushed me into a lot of the thinking that I was, uh, that I came to for piano playing. I see. Uh, and I think that those three cultures really have such strong and un very different, distinct thinking yeah, yeah. styles, mm -hmm. their perception of time, their perception of work, their perception of beauty are also different. Yeah. And yeah. perhaps you could have said that about any three cultures, but for me, it really was very striking and, and is always a point of, of reference for me. Like, sure. am I American and looking at this as American? What would I see? Am I mm -hmm. Chinese and looking at it from a Chinese perspective? What does that mean? And French, you know, what, what, how would they see it? And I think sure. that that kind of perspective uh, just came very naturally to me from the very yeah. beginning. Wow, I can relate that so much. And I'm sure a lot of our audience, you know, now maybe later on watching us from wherever they are right now currently, right? During pandemic, I hear everybody's back. And uh, I mean, I also, I moved to Kansas and without a word of English, you know, so that was kind of became my identity. So even to this day, people here in New York call me Topeka, you know, Topeka, Kansas. So it's a very interesting thing, but I want to hear, I know you had a CD with uh, Gulping and the WC. Um, can you talk about the connection that you draw from, I mean, 
obviously both composers are yes huge well boys. well Gao yeah. Ping I think uh, is he's he's a good friend and I met him many years ago when he was studying in Cincinnati at Cincinnati mm -hmm. Conservatory and I heard him play one of his vocalizing pianist pieces and I was just my jaw dropped and I was like right. I gotta get I gotta meet this guy and I have to I have to play that piece I have to somehow do that yeah. And uh, he, he's such a nice person for anybody who knows him. He's, he's so nice. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, I was in touch with him. Uh, I, I uh, premiered a piece of his for violin and piano mm. with my brother, who's a violinist in the Chicago Symphony. And we were all at home and doing nothing. And so I did this remote kind of collaboration with my brother. To and he was on the TV, piece. right? Was and he, we interviewed him, yes. And my brother was uh, on a video screen and we were doing a live virtual <laughs> was... uh, combination. And uh, really you know, by that time in April, things had kind of calmed down in terms of the pandemic in mm -hmm. China. They had already kind sure. of gotten it in control. And so Gao Ping said to me, you know, like, can I send you some masks? Do you need masks? We're, we have a lot of masks oh, and nice. I think we're at the end of our need yeah. for them. So I could definitely send you a supply. I said, that's so nice. That's sure. great. So he put it in the mail. We ended up mm -hmm. getting them in July because that's how long uh, the yes, mail Yes, exactly. I ordered some in the beginning too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, we still needed them in July. So that was not. <laughs> yes. But by, when they arrived, I was like, what's, what did Gao Ping send us? Like, what's going on? <laughs> uh, but, you know, in terms of music, so he, nice. He also has, because he studied in the States, he has a perspective mm -hmm. of Chinese music from a Western perspective. Mm -hmm. And his father is one of the great composers of traditional Chinese music. Mm -hmm. And so he's immersed in that. And so I think we connected on this different perspective approach to things. And I find his music is that kind of bridge between Western and Eastern culture. And the combination with Debussy, of course, was, I think, pretty natural. Uh, Debussy, uh, the pieces that I chose were the ones where he was discovering Eastern culture. And that was such a big revelation to him and to uh, Europe in general uh, around the turn of the 19th, 20th century. So I think that there were, in that particular program, bridges from both sides that kind of met in the middle and exchanged. And I was very, I was very proud of that, that particular program. I really love that. Yeah, that's, oh my goodness. So you see, I, sometimes I feel like there's always connection between every culture, you know, we are so far away, but so somehow we are also very much connected, you know, and the last question I want to ask, actually, you heard, uh, I mean, you went to Juilliard and uh, also Juilliard opened up a campus in Tianjin, uh, I guess your father in my hometown, and I have some friends working there now, and uh, she knew someone who was the main architect, designed it, you know, so I kind of, like my father said, he could see, uh, they used to drive up just to see, you know, because they feel so proud that nice. Juilliard decided to choose Tianjin as the second, you know, and uh, and I don't know if you know much about, you know, China, Chinese culture, besides that we work hard, but there's also a lot of culture, right? especially in Tianjin, right? We have a lot of musicians, we have a lot of uh, yeah. comedians. So what is your take? What do you think this means for the world, you know, now, you know, I, I see my friends have so much more gigs than we have, <laughs> you know, in Asia, in Shanghai, we're in Tianjin, yeah. we're in Beijing. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think China definitely is the future of classical piano. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, my, my parents left uh, mainland China in 49 and came to the States in the 50s. Mm. And they weren't particularly exposed to classical music but then when they were, they became extremely passionate about it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, more Catholic than the Pope, that kind of thing. Like all of a sudden, <laughs> crazy. all of a sudden to have something revealed to you sometimes can be mm -hmm. more inspiring than to grow up immersed in it. You don't really appreciate what you have. And I think that was their case. I think, you know, to generalize very broadly, I think mm -hmm. there is a kind of that, there's that dynamic happening in China. Mm. P 
piano music, the great canon of 400 years of piano music is inspiring. Mm. It is incredible. Yeah, for sure. And to not have it in your culture, then suddenly somehow have it at your disposal is a huge energy force that can power uh, you know, a lot of things. I think that's generally what one, you know, I can describe Chinese relationship with, with Western classical piano uh, like that. Um, and I think that there is a sense of a work ethic and a sense of discipline and that, that really coincides well with the work that one needs to do to become a, a good pianist. Sure. Uh, so I think that that general Asian kind of approach to, to working and, and, and time, even the con concept of time is very adapted there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do believe that there are some cultural yeah. vacuums, mm. some misunderstandings that can happen. I, I, that for me, that really has inspired me to see myself as, as much as possible, a bridge mm. persona. Yes, for sure. Uh, because I straddle both of those cultures and because I, I have been to China quite a bit and teaching there and hearing things since uh, my first visit in 1989. Wow. <laughs> uh, or in 19, cool. let's see, yeah, 1989. Uh, just before Tiananmen happened, right. I was there for like a month for a residency teaching and playing. In, and in, in Beijing? In Beijing and Central Xi'an. Central Conservatory? Okay, yes. Xi'an. And, um, yeah. you know, it, and I've been there regularly since then. And I, it's always been very interesting to see that the talent of the nine-year-olds that mm. I heard, no matter what year I went, there were always these amazing nine-year-olds yes. playing Chopin yes. etudes and 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 Mozart slow movements, and I just like, oh my God, unbelievable! Yeah. But Is then, as the students got older, they became more and more fitting the mold, and the personality yeah. was not there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of my work with the older students in China and people who have studied in China and who I've taught in Europe or, or the States is opening that up. Like it's mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. you know, the, the yep. knowledge, the desire for expression, the personal voice sure. is inside, but there's not a, there's no permission to let it out. Mm -hmm. There's no incentive to yeah, let it out. Right. And there's no instruction from from the schooling there currently to let it out. And it's it's interesting to see, even over the last 30 years of my experience, that that's mm -hmm. been a pretty consistent situation. Right. So I really then, feel like there has to be this cultural opening that allows all this training to to flower, to blossom, because it's an it's sure. amazing the potential yes, that's there. For sure. Uh, yeah, and uh, as I said, not just for piano, you know, you have right. these hundreds of thousands of trained Culture. pianists, millions of trained pianists, and they all think they're going to do something in piano. Yeah. You know, I hope not. <laughs> 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 piano, but right. literally, these could be <laughs> business leaders, these could be cultural community leaders, these could be inventors, these could True. be math, you know, these, these could be so many things informed mm -hmm. by, by piano training, right. and that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, and you, you say that you have some, um, right, piano students even now, right, online that you're teaching. So I'm sure that's, this pandemic maybe is changing something. You know? Yes, so the connection and the idea of who's teaching who and how and when, mm -hmm. that's all right. opening up, which is, I think, a really good thing. So Frederick, you have so many things that you can, you're offering, you know, just to by visit your website. We were like so blown away. We, we did not know where to start. <laughs> All the events that you're creating, it's a more like, um, almost like a play or a show, you know, where you have one event and then you can just use that to uh, go to, to travel to different places, seems like, and each mm -hmm. has a different theme. And so can you just a little bit tell us about that uh, maybe um it seems like you have several different uh events that you created the evolution yeah. of piano monument to beethoven carnival of animals and then the classical smackdown and 
Yeah, I mean, you all can empathize or you've experienced this. I mean, we put so much work into putting a program together. Mm -hmm. And very often it's a one time opportunity to play that program and we work so hard. And I really feel like the more a program can have its own message, then the more it deserves to be played as a package. And so I've always crafted my programs with that in mind, that there's some reason to put these pieces together in this order. And there's some storyline that, that can unfold mm -hmm. from that, that can, that can engage people. Like I have my, uh, you know, my monument to Beethoven. We talk about the, the actual monument to Beethoven in Bonn and the fundraising that went into that uh, in the early 1800s and how all these composers just kind of dropped the ball. Nobody gave money and nobody did very much to raise money, you know, mm. and the list came in and said, hey, this is not acceptable. And I'm just going to give the equivalent of, I think it was like $100,000 or whatever. Mm. Let's get this done. And uh, I have a great sculptor in mind and let's, let's just do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Uh, Schumann contributed the fantasy to the effort and mm. uh, said, I will donate, I, I forget how many scores, mm. uh, the sales of those first 100 scores, let's say, will go towards the monument fund. Mm. Mm. And then uh, when he saw that it wasn't going well, I think he just kind of said, well, uh, oh, did I, did I promise that? I, oh, I forgot. Uh, and then he turned it into a love story for, for Clara. Mm. You know, so, you know, he used what he had, which is great. And mm. uh, there's no criticizing uh, Schumann's fantasy. Mm. But, uh, you know, that was inspired by the Beethoven monument effort. And then Liszt, of course, transcribed all of Beethoven's symphonies. That in and of itself is a monument. Mm. So I put one of the symphonies with the Schumann fantasy and you have these two uh. monumental pieces that are mm -hmm. so different mm. from each mm. other. And yet they are tied together by this, this external event. Mm. And I think that story really says something mm. to a listener mm. who may love one or both works and who may love that in general, but then, hey, these are real people and they did things mm. and mm. the music was, was a result of that. And the music right. was, a, was a impetus mm. for those kinds of things. I do another series of, of programs I call Classical Smackdown, which is inspired by uh, The Voice and America's Got Talent, where <laughs> people basically vote for their favorite. And I love this series. I have three programs in it now, uh, and I'm presenting the program online in a few months. Uh, so, uh, you know, people who are interested can go to frederickchu.com and, and sign up and they'll get notification of that. Uh, basically two composers and I play pieces that I've chosen that really show the contrast or the similarity between mm. them and put them out there in different rounds for people to listen, mm. basically to, to taste and say, I like this taste better. I like this taste better and mm. to vote and then to see how their vote compares with others, mm. other votes and then to discuss, to debate, to fight with each other about <laughs> why did you vote for that? Mm. I love playing those programs in, in person, in concert, because at the end of the program, the lights go on and usually half the people are already out of their seats and trying to get out of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. At a classical SmackDown concert, they turn on the lights and everybody's in their seat and they're talking with their neighbors and they're like, hey, I don't know, I don't know. And old people are talking to young people and people who don't know each other are talking and everybody's like, discussing and debating and there's there's huge a, a huge ruckus and i just wow. love that afterlife of the concert yeah. that's how it should be i feel and if there's very some, mm -hmm. very yeah, audience there's engaging something that can make the audience engage mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. somehow feel like they're relevant then that mm -hmm. makes classical music relevant that makes yeah. this great music relevant today yeah, yeah. Right. but that just shows who you are, like you're trying to integrate music into our lives. With these kinds of events, it's more meaningful and the yeah. music becomes part of life. And that's just very innovative and uh, amazing. So then I'm thinking, 
you're coming from very traditional path, as you said, you know, until you hit the 20s and things happen and, you know, in France and so forth. But in my uh, impression is that you have this kind of, I don't want to say rebel, but uh, being original, it was within you. And but where does this really come from? Where does this <laughs> drive and force come from? I'm just curious. And that's a very interesting question. I, you know, I, I think there were some random things that happened, like this residency that offered its the opportunity offered itself when I finished school to stay in Paris for a year. And you know, who wouldn't do that? <laughs> um, and I think that going through those seven months without a bathroom and a kitchen and a piano. That was certainly not planned. That was not part of the, the grand scheme of things. And yet it was one of the key elements for my whole personal development and therefore my career development. Um, and I would say, you know, along the way, there were, of course, things that I regret. Uh, I regret, you know, having gone to school and not having this, this idea that, oh, here are my colleagues. I'm developing, I need to develop relationships with them because this is our support network. As we get older and become professionals, we, you know, we draw on this group of people and their ideas and their connections and, 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 and their energy. I didn't know that as a pianist, you know, very mm -hmm. isolated. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that definitely I regret mm -hmm. and has, uh, you know, pushed my career in, in certain directions. Uh, but I don't know the, you know, just the different approach to things really, I think, kicked off in when I discovered myself mm -hmm. in the twenties. And I think that when one discovers oneself, thing, interesting things start to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think especially these days with all of the technology and all the incredibly fast changes that are happening mm. the more you can reveal yourself to yourself and take advantage of all the tools there mm. it's going to be incredibly rich and yeah. diverse and unique you know all mm. these career paths i, I just uh, read something that you know, i'm doing some work with my wife on on education and the statistic is that a child entering school age years now this year is going to graduate and work in a job, 65% will be working in jobs that don't even exist today. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's exciting and that's scary. Mm. You know, so it, and it really puts a perspective on something that we're doing, which is piano, which has been mm -hmm. around, you know, at least 350 years, 400 mm -hmm. years, building slowly, mm -hmm. you know, note by note, <laughs> piece yeah. by piece. Yeah it really does put into perspective, if not put into question, what are we doing mm. and why are we doing this? Is this mm. really a tradition that we want to preserve? Mm. What are the exactly. things in it that are so important that mm. all these hundreds of millions of people are devoting their lives to it? Right. But in order for this tradition to survive, we have to evolve, keep evolving, keep discovering the possibility and that's exactly what you're doing and which is very inspiring and but this is something that we really are interested as a team of the piano pod and um, you're the really a great example of that well, so you. yeah really true so speaking of um, so you have such a so many things to offer to the next generations to come so and you started teaching in higher educational institution uh, as a full-time faculty member, uh, Carnegie Mellon University and the mm -hmm. Hart School. So yeah, we want to know. Started, yeah, that started a year ago. Oh, wow. How's it going? Uh, mm -hmm. It's been very interesting. You know, my whole life I've taught, but not in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. I, uh, mostly I've organized my DPS workshops. Like and taken some private students here and there, but ve for very specific periods of time and for very specific projects. Mm -hmm. And I was excited about the idea of doing academic teaching and having kind of a longer 
picture and a, a longer trajectory mm -hmm. for my teaching and for students' experience. And I was so excited that Carnegie Mellon offered me uh, this position. And mm -hmm. that that's a school that one of our kids went to and graduated from. So we knew the school already. And I was, my wife and I were, were like, if, if they don't accept him, then we're going to enroll in the school. <laughs> unfortunately, he, he, he graduated with, uh, with high distinction and, and oh, has, a, has a great uh, a career ahead of him because of that. And, and then to now be on the faculty is so exciting. Wow. And there's so much potential. And at the Hart School, uh, which is a great school with a long tradition and, and great reputation, uh, I'm a senior artist teacher there and having a great time with uh, a very diverse uh, student uh, makeup. And all of this in pandemic conditions. <laughs> you know, I think uh, it was a very strange coincidence that my mm -hmm. academic career has started with the pandemic mm -hmm. and remote teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, it's made it extremely easy because all of a sudden I wasn't traveling anymore at all mm -hmm. and I could say to my students okay these are my teaching days here are my teaching hours and we're just going to meet every week on this at the same day same time that's something that I couldn't do mm -hmm. uh, in normal circumstances right. right and the fact that I can teach a student in Pittsburgh and then the next hour, teach a student in Hartford. The next hour, teach a student in China with a 12 hour time zone difference. Uh, and then do a coaching in California and just be here and to be able to string those things one after another is amazing. And so I feel like, in some ways, I don't know how good I have it <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, I've never experienced any other way of, of teaching. And so I think for me, I love using the online tools. I love thinking about how to organize group activities, bringing people together from all of these different geographic places to work together in kind of a studio right. class. Uh, I love uh, being able to jump around. I love being accessible. It's, it's really so interesting that I don't have this, this experience which in some ways could be considered baggage. Mm. And I'm just starting this fresh and bringing as much as I can mm. uh, to the thinking and to the tools and, and to whatever I can do. Mm. Amazing and wonderful. Thank you so much. And I, I wish uh, you the best of luck of teaching. It's a Thank different you. setting because you know you have to raise these people for four, six years. So it's different from teaching just privately. So yeah, yes, I, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, great. In some ways, I feel it's a great, uh, you know, this long line of influence that I can have across mm. their their education career. Mm. At the same time, it's only a few points along that line, and you know, fifty minutes here, an hour there, and like, wow, really? <laughs> can I get anything across in that? that little amount of time. But Eric, to your point, you know, I was you, gonna say, you know, you, you did the masterclass. And, and yeah. so I, I try to keep that in mind mm -hmm. as well. And I and it's making me go back to my own uh, lessons with my great teachers. Mm -hmm. And just try and both of them unfortunately passed last year. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, right when I was getting my mm -hmm. my positions and starting this mm -hmm. and and started to have questions that I never had before. They're not available to, to ask and to, to learn their experience uh, directly. So I'm, I'm reliving a lot of stuff, trying to remember my student life and trying to remember like, wow, what did my lessons with Abby Simon, were they really like just one, you know, like three lessons in this week and then I'd go for like a month and a half without lessons. Yeah. Did that really happen? <laughs> and it did, you know, because he was traveling and performing during that time. And I didn't find anything wrong with that. So it, it puts into, it, it just gives me a lot of things to think about and to, to see how I was influenced and try to try to imbue that as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I can say that speaking as a student, uh, a son, a parent, and a teacher, 
you know, you never know what's going to stick with somebody. You know, mm. we, we give everything we can of ourselves, you know, all our best stuff. And, um, and sometimes it doesn't resurface for a long time. Yeah. You know, when I, when I went to Banff to do my long-term residencies after graduate school I, and I didn't have a full-time teacher, I realized that was when I really started listening to my teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like all the stuff that they said to me yeah. while I, I was doing my master's would come back and I was like, oh, now I see why that's relevant. Mm -hmm. Right. And then that's when you really pay attention. So as right. teachers and uh, also parents raising kids, it's the same thing. All you can Absolutely. do is Absolutely. try your best. And it's up to, ultimately it's up to the student um, to decide what they're going to take from it. Right. Um, well, Frederick, of course, we could talk to you all day, um, but uh, <laughs> we, we don't have unlimited time. So I'm going to ask you two last um, uh, related questions, and then we're going to move on to our rapid fire round. Um, so, uh, those, uh, two questions are, first of all, uh, you know, what's your biggest piece of advice for, uh, younger pianists coming up in the world today and related to that, what do you see the role of concert pianists in this modern world and the future to come? Mm -hmm. A piece of advice to young students really at this point, it's so hard to find the time to do daily practicing. It's so difficult with all the things that are calling to us, all the things that are available, you know, with a click, with a yeah. tap, you know, it's, it's really a luxury to be able to focus on one activity and, but it, it, it's an emotional struggle. Discipline for me is an emotional struggle. Delayed gratification is a very unnatural thing it's a very it's a very human thing as well you know animals are not very good at delayed gratification right uh but we can do that and we can train ourselves to do that more and more and it it just builds the gratification just builds exponentially when it does happen so that's you know sometimes <laughs> often we don't want to practice. <laughs> right? I found myself during the pandemic going for weeks and weeks without touching the piano because I just don't find the motivation to go there. So really we need to train ourselves to, to find any little scrap of motivation to practice because in the end, it definitely shows itself. So that's my advice to young pianists to please don't despair and really see this as a emotional disciplinary discipline training. I love that you said that delayed gratification is one of the fundamental things that makes us human, right? So everybody practice the piano because it's gonna make you a better human being. Yeah, and there, there's a limited time to when physical practicing is going to actually make a big difference. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how old uh, your average age is, but you know, unfortunately that age comes at, uh, I don't know, 15, 16, you know, 17 years old. It's not that you can't make physical progress after that, but it's a lot harder. And I can say from my own experience, I've had to go back to doing technical exercises and, and technical training, practicing just to keep in shape. And, uh, you know, I've, I was fortunate that I did. In fact, I can show you one of the tools that I have. Oh, wonderful. Ah, this is a cast iron piping oh my goodness wow that, uh, my my teacher when i was 10 years old recommended <laughs> my parents went to a hardware store and got this, this is about five pounds oh my gosh and these are my dad's old socks <laughs> <laughs> my, mother, my mother sewed onto these there's a little bit of cotton padding i can't even get my hand through it anymore but yeah. you know 10 years old i was a small 10 year old and i could get my hands through and i would wear these on my wrist and do all of my practicing scales, exercises, etudes, the uh, regular repertoire, all, you know, an hour or two hours with these five pound weights on each arm. Oh my goodness. And a special relaxation technique that allowed yep. that to happen longer than a minute. Uh, and I didn't uh, get tendonitis and <laughs> I didn't, uh, you know, mess up my muscle system. In fact, it helped me build muscle and I was fortunate to have done that, to have had that combination. Wow. And I feel like if we get that early enough, it's, it really does stay with you. And so there's a time for physical practice 
before 18 is definitely that time. If you're 18 years old or under, just play the piano. Just play, 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 play. Move those fingers as much as you can. After that, just be prepared to not play as much. Literally, mm -hmm. your piano playing will improve by not playing as much after 18 than before 18. And then okay. you start thinking, you start looking at yourself, you start revealing these emotional and mental things that you've built up from that, that super intense practicing. And then you reveal what you really have inside of you as a unique, as a unique person. I am definitely making this a clip and sending it to all my students under 18. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> Holy. Oh my God. Uh, and and in, terms of, in terms of relevance of pianists today, I, you know, one thing that pianists do that almost nobody else trains themselves to do consciously is multitasking. The pianist at the very first lesson before we even know what the notes are named and you know what's going on, the teacher will say, okay, play these notes with this finger, play these notes with these, this finger. This is the melody, this is the accompaniment. Boom, we're multitasking. Yeah. Everybody multitasks, but pianists multitask consciously and we train from the very beginning. It's ingrained in the idea of playing the piano is multitasking. Mm -hmm. And so we have the societal need for group activity, for collaboration. And this I call all for one, all of us in to do one thing. That's incredibly important. It's a very human thing. Although higher animals do that a lot, you know, hives and swarms, they, they, <laughs> you know, they do that. And we do that as humans, we come together, we kind of, uh, if se we're, we self-efface enough to be able to contribute to a, a greater, uh, greater whole. And piano playing is the flip side to that, which is the one for all. One person training themselves to be able to do more than one thing at a time, to be able to keep attention on the melody and on the accompaniment and possibly on a middle voice, mm. uh, to be able to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time <laughs> and even more complicated things and not just for practical reasons, but for an aesthetically satisfying, emotionally gratifying, intense communication reason. There's, there's no greater need for those kinds of skills than today. And, and this is an exercise I do. I think about you know, all the jobs, all the careers that people have, all the different professions, and you really think about it like, they don't need to multitask. Of course, if they do, they're better at their job, but their training doesn't really bring that out as a conscious thing. They, it doesn't bring out the physical, the mental, the emotional depth that playing the piano does. There's almost no other activity that does body, mind, heart, multitasking training than playing the piano. And I would put it out as a challenge to your listeners like, you know, what other profession trains and requires the training to the depth that piano playing does in those areas, body, mm -hmm. mind, heart. Yeah. And of course, having the training in any area will make you a better whatever you are. But being a pianist, you just have it and then you have to reveal it. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that if people knew that, then we would make all of our school kids play the piano. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's one of the most all encompassing, deep, intense trainings that one can have. And I, I really don't think there's anything quite like it. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a pianist after you've done that training. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would love to have a whole, uh, you know, company uh, employees all trained pianists but not doing any piano <laughs> i think it would be a, a great business i would have a i would love to have a government where all the all the appointees oh, are, please, are yes. piano amen to that <laughs> you know, that would be amazing you know and certainly artists and musicians performers who have piano training you know, of course so Doctors. for me it, it might be biased but that that seems to me kind of a kind of a deep deep 
function of what piano and pianists can do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think more and more these days we see an increasing number of studies that show that multitasking is actually extremely difficult for humans to do. It's actually not natural. And so the more you train at multitasking, the more you really increase your capability to excel in any area. And piano yeah. certainly does require that more than most other things. Yeah. Um, Okay, so before the rapid fire, first of all, we want to make sure that we promote your SmackDown concert series, um, which you can find out more about at frederickchu.com, correct? Correct. Uh, There's a sign up sheet uh, there, and then I'll, I'll be emailing. These are going to happen. Uh, there are three of them, one a month, probably March, April, May, possibly April, May, June. Uh, dates to be determined very soon. And uh, you're also launching a Patreon to go along with that. All that's right. right. That's going to be time to 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 open up uh, probably March in in preparation for the SmackDown series. Great. This All is right. rather a new segment. It's called the Piano Pod Rapid Fire Questions. So I would like for you to answer each question with short answers. Okay. So are we ready? Yes. Ready. All right. So question number one. Um, so you are you have really diverse background, you know you lived in France and your your parents are Chinese and you lived in, uh, you were born raised in in the, in the United States. So, what do you consider a comfort food for you? What is the uh, dumplings? I I held the world record uh, for my family in dumpling eating for for forty years. Oh wow! Oh my goodness! Okay, <laughs> <laughs> great. So now, are you a Cats or dog person? Cats. Okay. Next question. What is your word to live by? Multitasking. Multitasking. <laughs> what is the most import important quality you look for in people? Honesty. Honesty. What is the worst quality in people you want to stay away from? Hmm. I would say bragging. Bragging, great. All right, Eric, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, can you name three people who inspire you, living or dead? Three people who inspire me. Uh, can I do four piano related? Sure. Sure. Uh, Richter, Horowitz, Glenn Gould, and then above that triumvirate, Alfred Cortot. Oh, okay, <sighs> wonderful. Um, okay, well, related to that, which historical figure, uh, composer, pianist, would you want to take lessons from if he or she were alive? Uh, ooh, that's a hard one between Liszt and uh, Courtauld. Mm. Okay. I would say Liszt because that's less uh, accessible and we actually have Courtauld teaching master classes uh, recorded, so. Yeah, we can only imagine how Liszt played, right? Yes. Um, okay, and then which historical figure or composer would you want to hang out at the bar with? Oh, list for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Name one piece in your current playlist. Oh, in my current playlist, um, I would say Cars from Mars, uh, Robert Ian. <laughs> Good okay. one. All right. Name a book title you're currently reading. I'm currently reading uh, a, 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 what is it? a Short Swim in a Pond by George Saunders. Just came out. One of my favorite writers and uh, a friend of mine. You get only one song or piece to listen to for the rest of your life. What is it? Uh, Prokofiev's Second Concerto. All right, very cool. And last question, last not least, fill in the blank. Music is blank. What is music? Music is life. Music is life. Ding, ding, ding. We, we heartily yeah. agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, my friends, I'm afraid we're going to have to end here for today. That concludes this episode of The Piano Pod. Thank you, Frederick Chu, for joining our show today. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. As always, we want to remind you guys that his classical SmackDown series will be available at frederickchu.com. The link will be in the description as always. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, please read and review on whatever podcasting platform you use. If you are watching it from YouTube, please hit the thumbs up button and be sure to subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. The links are in the description below. All right, everyone. Hope to see you for the next episode of the Piano Pod. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Frederick. much, Frederick. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye.